tonight on CBC Vancouver News. You tell us one thing and then you take and rip it away. You're counting on it and then all of a sudden nothing. Flooded Fraser Valley renters fear they could lose their homes again as financial support dries up. What happened when CBC News got involved? Also, a massive settlement on the most massive project. A BC First Nation reaches a partial deal in its fight against the Site C Dam. And it's been pretty crazy in previous years. And obviously, that, that's a little bit cramped, right? Do you have a reservation? You will now need one if you want to park at a very popular Lower Mainland hotspot. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, I'm Dan Burrow. Thanks for joining us. Nearly eight months after devastating floods cut through parts of BC, some renters in the Fraser Valley say they are worried about losing their homes again as financial support expected from the Red Cross abruptly stopped earlier than expected. But once the CBC's Benit Breach started reporting on those problems, the charity apologized and is now promising help. Anastasia Shell is worried she could lose her Abbotsford home for a second time. We're petrified. We're scared we're going to be on the street. Back in March, Shell learned the Red Cross would cover a damage deposit, plus $1,300 toward rent for six months and an additional $600 for basic necessities. She says the money came for one month, and that was it. Mary Dyke tells a similar story. She was told the Red Cross would help with rent for six months. She says it stopped after three months. Fear. I am really scared of what's going to happen. Now her biggest worry is being forced to live out of her truck. She and Shell say they were counting on support from the Red Cross to get by, and neither is able to work because of health issues. I budget for that, and now they cut you off cold turkey. Tell us one thing, and then you take and rip it away. We've had enough ripped away. The Red Cross won't comment on individual cases, but says it's not seizing financial assistance. As of May, the charity says it's given out more than $19 million for flood relief to over 7,500 households. But for some relying on help, it's not exactly clear why that support has dried up. Emergency Management BC says the province's relationship with the charity has been extremely valuable, but acknowledges there have been problems too. Making it work is something flood victims like Stan Verbeek say is urgent. He also expected funding over six months, but says he hasn't seen any of it and didn't hear from the Red Cross until the CPC began reporting on these issues. The 71-year-old had given up on the charity, frustrated with what he called poor communication. You're counting on it and then all of a sudden nothing. Then he says the charity apologized and told them they want to make things right. Shell and Dyke also heard from the Red Cross after CBC's reporting. They say the charity apologized to them and conversations have picked up. They could find out tomorrow if more help is coming. In the meantime, they are all relying on the Yero Food Hub for help. While they are grateful how the Red Cross has come through in some ways, they believe it can be done better and not just for them, but the community as a whole. Honor what you've said. Help us. We don't want to be on the street. Reassurance they say can go a long way in times of uncertainty. Benit Breach, CBC News, Abbotsford. And we have a follow to Benit's story now. The Red Cross confirms to CBC News it has been in touch with those flood victims and it says it's working to ensure they can access the financial support they're counting on. The union representing BC paramedics claims staffing shortages still leave the province just as vulnerable to deadly heat as last year. And I can tell you if that heat dome happened this week, it would be very similar, if not worse. The, the staffing has not improved uh, in any significant or you know, tangible matter throughout the province. Tate attributes the issue to a lack of planning by BC Emergency Health Services and problems with recruiting and keeping paramedics. Tate says ambulance arrival times are processed through the triage system where those with less priority had to wait hours for help to arrive. He says some communities like Maple Ridge were left with no ambulances last night and it's hard for other districts to cover. So then eventually you're starting to play a game of Russian roulette with people's lives where there's just not enough physical ambulances to go to the calls. He says part of the issue is due to wages being lower compared to their counterparts in emergency response. He's calling for more supports for paramedics' mental health as well and occupational injuries. 
Lynn is a massive step forward, one of the biggest and most controversial energy projects in this province's history. The West Moberly First Nations have now settled part of their lawsuit against the Site C Dam project. Early and Young joins us live now with details. Lee, and this deal involves the First Nations, the province, BC Hydro, as well as the federal government. What have they agreed to, first of all? Well, Dan, uh, let me tell you the most significant parts of the settlement first. It includes a one-time lump sum payment to the West Moberly First Nations and for the first 70 years of site seat ongoing payments. There's also 5,000 acres of crown land that will be transferred to West Moberly. And land management of another 15,000 acres will be reviewed and improved. As a quick reminder, Site C is the $16 billion hydroelectric dam project near Fort St. John. It's in the Peace River Valley there. The West Moberly First Nations had filed a civil lawsuit. They said the dam will cause irrepar irreparable harm to its territory and way of life, rights protected under Treaty 8. We're painfully aware that Site C is not going to stop. Um, they've, they've accomplished what they were set out to do is to push this thing past the point of no return. And, uh, you know, if there's no amount of money that we could expend in the courts and have any judge in the land rule against us or rule with us on this. Leanne, the West Moberly First Nations had, had lots to say about this development, not all of it positive, we know. Uh, how are they reacting? Well, you heard uh, Chief Roland Wilson just talk uh, a couple of seconds ago. They agreed to this settlement, but it's clear they're not happy about the project. Um, they're worried about how fish and caribou in the region will be affected by the dam. There is another court challenge over treaty rights that will be suspended for now as talks continue. BC Hydro CEO Chris O'Reilly sent a statement. It says in part, I appreciate that it has been a difficult decision for West Moberly to resolve its claim against Site C. These agreements provide us the foundation to move forward together in a manner that fosters a mutually beneficial relationship. The province and federal minister of Crown Indigenous Relations also released statements, all of them recognizing how important the agreements are in the spirit of reconciliation, with Bruce Ralston, BC's energy minister, saying how difficult it was for West Moberly First Nations to choose to settle. The remainder of the claim will be resolved through more confidential negotiations. Dan. All right. Leanne Young reporting live for us tonight. Thanks very much. You're welcome. If you are looking to beat the summer heat with a drive to busy Bunsen Lake, you better have a reservation now. Visitors will need a parking pass to drive their cars into the park. It's the latest recreation area in our region to institute a pass program to curb high volumes. As John Hernandez reports, some outdoor enthusiasts call it a Band-Aid solution. It might not be peak hours at Bunsen Lake, but most people here know just how busy it can get on a hot day like this. It's been pretty crazy in previous years where there's been so many people and you had to park out in the street or walk in the two kilometers. And when you pack up your van full of everything for the day and you have your kids in the car and they're hoping to get in to go to the lake and then you can't get here, it's, it's frustrating. Today, a roadblock coming in signaling the launch of a new parking program. Park goers must now register their vehicles ahead of their visit for a highly coveted parking spot. It's seen an increase in visitors uh, over the last couple of years and it's also created uh, the first come first serve parking system has created a lot of problematic issues in the village of Anne more specifically when it comes to traffic congestion. Many guests here have had run-ins with the big crowds and understand the need. Sometimes when you come it's so full and you don't know whether you're going to get a spot or not. So, so. you start off your relaxing day be, by being frustrated, right? <laughs> it's, it's, this was good. But the system isn't without its critics. Initially, I was a little bit uh, kind of against it mm -hmm. because, you know, just the freedom to come anytime you want. Uh, you know, obviously that, that's a little bit cramped, right? I only came for about an hour for the dog park, so I find in that regard it might be a little bit silly because I have to book like a whole four hour spot and then it kind of takes away from someone else. So Bunsen Lake is just the latest recreation area to introduce day passes. Three provincial parks in the region, including Golden Ears, also require them during the summer months to reduce high volume. 
Some outdoor enthusiasts say demand will only increase in the years ahead as the population grows. We would definitely like to see you know more investments going into uh, expanding uh, you know existing uh, recreation amenities and parks, acquiring new areas. Because what we what we're seeing right now is that uh, you know uh, agencies like like BC Hydro and and other recreation agencies are trying to to play catch up. A region known for its beauty that is struggling to accommodate all the people who want to enjoy it. John Hernandez, CBC News and more. The well-known endangered whale population in B.C. is going hungry because of a lack of its favorite food. Southern resident killer whales typically prey on Chinook salmon in the Salish Sea and the west coast of Vancouver Island. But a new study from UBC suggests the number and size of those salmon are dropping, meaning less food for their predators. Researchers say the whales have not been getting enough to eat since 2018, and now there is an urgency to find solutions. What can be done is really to look at the different factors that could affect those prey populations. Uh, fishing has been drastically reduced in the late 1990s, but there are other factors that we need to look at, such as marine mammal predation on the salmon population, but also the impact of climate change and rising temperature and prevalence of diseases. So there is more research needed going forward to understand what affects those salmon populations. There are 73 southern resident killer whales alive and in the ocean in as of October last year. Meteorologist, meteorologist, easy for me to say, Johanna Wagstaff got joins it. us now. Finally got it. I've had enough practice at that, I should. We're going to get to the forecast <laughs> in a moment, Joe. Uh, but we have to take things a bit more seriously. A look back to a year ago and the conditions in the days before the village of Lytton was wiped out by fire. What more do you have on that? Yeah, Dan, we'll be talking a lot more about that one-year anniversary in the days to come. But it was June 29th that Lytton broke an all-time new national record, hitting 49.6 degrees. And here we are on the tail end of another heat wave, nowhere near heat dome status, but the warmest we've felt in some time. And the hotspot across the country today, Lytton, British Columbia, at uh, 37.9 degrees, consistently one of the hottest spots in Canada. In fact, in, a, in any given summer in recent years, Lytton will surpass the 30-degree mark over 80 times in a summer. So what makes it so hot? Uh, our colleagues from Radio Canada were just recently on the ground. Uh, Lytton, for those of you who don't know, is situated in a canyon, a canyon. So when the sun hits the slopes, the rocks of the slopes, uh, the rocks absorb that heat and end up emitting it through the overnight, which is why the overnights are often so extreme. And then the bowl shape ends up trapping that heat. Uh, we often see 16 hours of daylight uh, in the summer months. Uh, we know that this makes Lytton more vulnerable to climate change. Uh, take a listen to a researcher on that connection and what we saw last summer. Lytton's in a valley and it's a very dry location. So when you get sunshine, the energy goes to raising the temperature instead of evaporating moisture. I've been studying climate change and fire for 30 years or more. And I wasn't expecting this until 2040s at the earliest. And we knew it was going to come just not that early in the decade and it's not out of the question that we could see a 50 degree temperature hit uh, within our lifetimes or within the next uh, decade in Lytton. Here's a look at the hottest uh, temperatures hit with this heat, heat wave. Again, nowhere near the 49.6 we hit almost a year ago, but 37.9, the hot spot across the country today. And it was also the hot spot yesterday and the day before. Uh, hitting the mid thirties across other parts of BC, uh, heat warnings, still in place, uh, not the kind of heat that uh, BC would need to issue the new uh, BC heat uh, emergency response uh, system, but you can see those heat warnings still in place for both the uh, uh, interior, uh, the south coast, I should say, uh, inland sections, and then all the way up through Terrace, uh, where we did hit the uh, mid-30s once again today. Things are changing quickly uh, as the system slides in from the south, so that's it for this heat wave, Dan, but I'll take you through the future mm -hmm. forecast coming up in a bit. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. The Hockey Hall of Fame has announced its class of 2022, and it features a trio of Vancouver Canucks. Daniel Sedin's first National Hockey League goal. Hendrick sets it up for Daniel. 
Yes, Henrik and Daniel Sedin, along with Roberto Luongo, all headlined the class of 2022. The twin brothers spent their entire careers in Vancouver, where they both had more than 1,000 points. Meanwhile, Roberto Luongo spent some of his best years here on the West Coast. He ranked third in NHL history with 489 wins when he retired. He also helped Canada win gold at the 2010 Winter Games here. Fans in Vancouver say all three have earned the Hall of Fame nod. Um, they're great guys. Um, the Sedins, you can't really say anything bad about them. Um, top stand-up guys and great, great players as well. It's too bad they weren't able to pull off that, uh, the Stanley Cup Finals, because I think that would have been the only thing missing from the Sedins' resume. But the Sedins have done so much for the city. They've donated to um, so many charities. They have a lot of points, uh, mini goals, so I think, uh, yeah, he deserves it. Candidates had to receive at least 75% of the vote from the selection committee to be inducted into this year's Hall of Fame. This was the first year the Sedins and Luongo were eligible. Well done. It is a living giant and a massive discovery to boot how this tree was found on the North Shore and how old it might be. That's next. Thanks for joining our commercial-free live stream. A Newfoundland brewery has been sneaking in quotes from classic episodes of The Simpsons. And that's great news for the CBC's Zach Gowdy, who, like me, is a bona fide fan. So we sent him to the Mount Pearl Brewery to test his Simpsons knowledge. Are you guys Simpsons super fans? I grew up watching it with my family every Sunday night. I'll just have a cup of coffee. There it is. Hi, my name is Chris Conway. I'm the general manager and co-founder of Landwash Brewery. Hi, my name is Christina Cody. I'm brewmaster and co-founder of Landwash Brewery. We collaborated with Mallard Cottage, Chinch Bistro, uh, and Newfoundland Sausage Company to make these really super summer-friendly barbecue beer eight packs. And it, because it's a big initiative, our production team decided to have a little fun with uh, the date coder and put Simpsons quotes hidden on the bottom of the cans next to the date codes. So we date coat our beer because for beer, it's very important to have it fresh. So we wanted to just make a little playful, fun way of being like, okay, check your date codes, find some nice fresh beer. Okay, it's Simpsons trivia time. Let's see if I can remember which episodes these canned quotes come from. Hit me. All right. My bratwurst has a first name. It's F-R-I-T-Z. Rainier Wolfcastle is remembering his childhood. My bratwurst has a first name. It's F-R-I-T-Z. I see you played Knifey Spoonie before. Uh, it's from The Simpsons Go Down Under when Bart makes prank phone calls to Australia, has to go to Australia to apologize. You call that a knife? This is a knife. You don't win friends with salad. From the classic Lisa a Vegetarian, it's from the barbecue episode. You don't win friends with salad. You, you don't, don't win, win friends, friends with, with salad. salad. And the last one, it's still good, it's still good. From the pig flying through the air, one of the highlights of the Lisa the Vegetarian, the barbecue episode. Who hasn't said that in their own life? Exactly. <laughs> it's still good, it's still good. Anytime anything lands on the floor. It's just a little slimy. It's still good, it's still good. Working on the canning line can be a, a long day, and so putting in these little little jokes to kind of poke fun at everything just makes everybody a little bit happier after an eight-hour shift of canning beer.
A massive, ancient, and rare red cedar has been uncovered on the North Shore. It's at least a thousand years old and could be twice that. This tree, known as the North Shore Giant, is somewhere within Lynn Headwaters Regional Park. Two conservationists, self-appointed tree hunters, tracked it down, and they're not sharing its exact location. It's thought to be the largest cedar on Canada's mainland. The base is nearly six meters across. Though the top has come down, the cedar is very much alive still, but very fragile. So for the moment they met this giant, let's talk to Ian Thomas, a biologist with the Ancient Forest Alliance. Ian, it took you 10 hours to bushwhack and get to this red cedar. What was it like when you finally met it? Awe-inspiring. A certain kind of just spiritual awe. This tree is so ancient and so huge, and it's so rare to find these old-growth giants still surviving um, that it was just profound. And it's located in this beautiful grove of um, other ancient red cedars. Um, yeah, it, it, it was be, being able to experience something like that is it really touches mm -hmm. you deeply. Now, it is in Lynn Valley on, on the North Shore, but otherwise, you're keeping the precise or general location rather under wraps. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a really rugged area. And so I don't think it's entirely safe to have a whole bunch of people going in after there. And it's also pretty fragile. You know, this is a fragile old growth ecosystem. And um, you'd be surprised at how uh, easily it is to sort of damage um, uh, those habitats. So there are places in Vancouver, like the beautiful Kennedy Creek Cedar on the way to Kennedy Falls, which is a stunning giant tree where people can see these trees where they're accessible. Uh, but this one is uh, currently a guarded secret. Give us a sense of the health of this tree. You mentioned it. It is ancient, uh, possibly thousands of years old. Uh, is it? Is it still growing? Oh yeah, it's still growing. Um, it's uh, it's a veteran though, and so the the storms and mischances of history have really scored and marked this huge tree. In fact, its central crown has been shattered, probably about uh, fifteen meters up. And so and it's, it's this huge, thick body that actually tapers to these narrow little leaders. Um, but those leaders are, are healthy. They've got nice green foliage. This tree is still photosynthesizing and, 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 and you know, still in its very slow way, still growing. Um, but these ancient cedars, they, uh, they all have a personality of their own. They've been sculpted by centuries uh, to this unique appearance. Why do you think this tree was never logged? Is it simply because it's, it's in such a remote area? Yeah, it's an incredibly steep boulder field. So um, Lynn Valley uh, was one of the ground zero points for logging actually in this country for industrial logging. So some of the largest trees on earth actually came out of Lynn Valley, some of the tallest, even taller maybe than the Redwoods. Um, but they cleaned out the very accessible, easy valley bottom stuff. Um, and at that time they left the trees that were way up those steep uh, rocky slopes. And lastly, what does the health of this tree tell you about the health of our forest overall? Well, our forests overall aren't healthy because they're being logged on an industrial scale. So here in British Columbia, we're one of the last places we're actually logging these ancient trees. Trees as old as this giant, thousands of years old, are being logged right now in BC. And it's critically important that the government invests money in setting aside old growth forests. We actually need conservation financing, which is because these ancient rainforests are all located on the unceded territory of First Nations people. And so uh, in order for the government to protect them, they need to be engaging with these First Nations communities and offering investment in those communities in a range of economic options, such as tourism, sustainable second growth forestry, um, aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture, in order to provide the critical um, economic um, support so that uh, these ancient old growth forests can be set aside. So we're calling on the government, the BC government, to set aside $300 million, which would join money already being invested by the federal government, as well as potential money um, from philanthropic sources that then can be used to promote 
sustainable economic options in these rural and indigenous communities, and therefore we can finally set aside these critically important old growth forests. Ian Thomas, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. The next time you dip your toes into a lake anywhere in our province, you might want to take a closer look at the water. That's because an invasive species of jellyfish believed to be native to southeast China is making a new home for itself in our waters. It's unclear how it got here, but scientists say the Craspidacusta sour bee has been here for some time. In 2020, I was called by an observer on Vancouver Island who used to swim in a lake year after year. And she basically said she, she, she got the feeling that there is something that reminds her to a jellyfish. But everybody knows that there is no jellyfish in lakes. So she, she worried a little bit and reached out to me because she knew that I'm working with gelatinous sewer plankton in the ocean. So I basically went over to Vancouver Island, inspected that lake, and actually confirmed her observation that it's a jellyfish. And at that time, I knew myself very little about freshwater jellyfish. So I needed to read up about it. And and, uh, it's, it's a very surprising moment because in a very peaceful environment, such a small lake, you, you would never expect to find a jellyfish. And to be honest, in the beginning, I had a hard time identifying where they are. But once I realized what I'm looking for, the size and the movement, especially the, the light reflections, um, then I realized, aha, uh -huh, okay, that's, that's the object of interest. And then I realized they are literally everywhere in that lake. A Russian missile strike hit a busy shopping mall in a south city southeast of the capital, Kiev, Ukraine. The devastation on the ground and the frantic search for survivors after this. Flash floods and mudslides continue to threaten parts of the interior of British Columbia. People in Penticton are warily watching the rising waters of Lake Okanagan, and a major cleanup is underway in Revelstoke, where a wall of mud derailed a freight train. Nine people have been killed by the floods and slides. Ian Hedemansing reports. About the only consolation for cleanup crews here was that this slide could have been so much worse. Tons of mud and rock ripped through the Trans-Canada Highway near Revelstoke and tossed about a dozen freight cars off the railway tracks. But no one was caught in the debris, which still hasn't been cleared away. They were busy cleaning up near Kelowna as well, where flash floods and mudslides killed five people earlier this week, and where there is growing controversy over what some residents feel is a link between this clear-cut logging and some of the slides. And I think the reason that it slid was because of the, of the water. The, the, the soil was absolutely saturated. I mean, the trees were barely hanging on. All they needed was a good flush of water, which came from above, to start the chain reaction, and it all went. When they start talking clear cut now, I'll be right behind whoever is against it. Although lake levels in the Okanagan Valley are still rising, the sunshine has made a lot of people optimistic that the worst may be over. It's not so big problem right now. Hopefully we will not raise anymore. The temporary emergency planning office set up in Penticton has been monitoring water and oh, soil saturation levels. It says conditions are getting under control. If we don't get any further large rainfalls, uh, if the temperature doesn't get up to the plus 30 degree level to cause the snowpack to melt, things should stay relatively uh, stable. And for those who have suffered damage, there was a promise today of financial aid from the provincial government. We're trying to help immediately wherever we can and however we can. Meanwhile, many in the province are still anxiously watching swollen creeks and rivers, hoping that they stay below the danger point. Ian Hanamansing, CBC News in the Okanagan Valley.
In Russia's invasion of Ukraine, another barrage of missiles has hit targets far from the front lines. That includes a strike Ukraine's president called one of the most brazen terrorist attacks in Europe's history, which killed several civilians. As the CBC's Chris Brown shows us, Ukrainian officials count at least 13 bodies so far. An inferno of flames and towering black smoke is all that's left of another civilian target hit by Russian missiles, a shopping mall in central Ukraine. The country's presidential administration says more than 1,000 people were inside. Is anybody alive? Is anybody alive? Someone calls out. I was not far away from the place where it happened. Vadim Yudenko was nearby and saw it all. The center was just destroyed. I just am out of words. I did not expect that some, something like this could happen in my, in my town. Amid the chaos of the rescue effort, it may be a while before the full extent of the casualties are known. At risk. A UN spokesman condemned the attack, but notably um, not the attacker, Russia. We're obviously concerned about the intensifying uh, fighting that we have seen. Indeed, here in Kharkiv, there have been so many missile hits in recent days that the shocks of incoming artillery, rockets and missiles have been non-stop. A Russian Iskander ballistic missile did this, said a local resident. There used to be a garage here. I have no idea what the Russians expected to destroy. Russia's Ministry of Defense admits to hitting only military targets, saying its artillery has been destroying Ukrainian nationalists, as it calls them, as it seeks to consolidate control of the city of Severodonetsk and continues to move towards the next target, the city of Lysychansk. In the middle of all the missiles, foreign leaders are still visiting Kyiv. Today it was a visit from Ukraine's neighbor, the president of Moldova. Moldova fully supports the independence sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Due to the Russian threat from the skies, we're in an air raid shelter now. Analysts, including advisors to Ukraine's government, say all these missile strikes may be the Kremlin's way of trying to put pressure on G7 nations to stop helping Ukraine or to get the West to push Ukraine into trading land for peace, something very few Ukrainians will accept. Chris Brown, CBC News, Kharkiv. Ukraine's leader, meanwhile, renewed his plea for more weapons and more punishing sanctions to counter Russian aggression. He addressed world leaders gathered for a second day of the Group of Seven Summit in Germany. And as David Cochran reports, the embattled nation's dire urgency was not lost on the G7 leaders. The future of Ukraine has been on their agenda. Today, the country's president was on their screen. G7 leaders speaking directly to President Volodymyr Zelensky about his country's needs. Zelensky asked for continued military support to battle Russia and all possible assistance to free Ukrainian grain from Russian blockades. He urged the leaders to unleash new sanctions to further punish and pressure the Kremlin and received a commitment that the world's richest democracies would help Ukraine rebuild once the fighting ends. We are discussing all the topics that are on the agenda, especially staying united in supporting the Ukraine against the Russian aggression. And uh, we understood that the policies of all our countries are very much aligned. On that point, Canada announced new sanctions targeting Russia's defense sector and blocked the export of advanced technology that could be used by the Russian military. But as Zelensky laid out what he needs to fight Russia, NATO spelled out what it will do to contain Russia. We will enhance our battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance up to brigade levels. We will transform the NATO response force and increase the number of our high readiness forces to well over 300,000. Canada leads the NATO battle group in Latvia, where about 700 Canadian troops are stationed. That mission will be significantly increased in what Stoltenberg calls the biggest overhaul of NATO's defense and deterrence since the Cold War. I expect it will make clear that allies consider Russia as the most significant and direct threat to our security. This means Canada will have to increase its troop contributions to NATO. The precise details aren't known, but are expected to be made clear at the NATO summit in Spain on Wednesday. 
David Cochran, CBC News, Garmisch Pettenkirchen, Germany. Wimbledon is welcoming back crowds to watch this year's championships. With Rebecca Marino eliminated in the first round today, there are now three Canadian players still competing on arguably the most famous lawns in the world. But as Ashley Burke tells us, the global outcry over Russia's war in Ukraine means players from two countries will not be stepping onto the iconic grass courts. This is one of the big screens set up in London where the public can come and watch what's considered one of the most prestigious and famous tennis tournaments. And this year, Wimbledon is off to a controversial start. The organizers have banned all players from Russia and Belarus from competing. This is a move that's in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Here's what fans here in London had to say about that. I think it's necessary from a um, political perspective and a perspective of showing support for the terrible situation and the struggles of the, the Ukrainian um, people. Wimbledon is a private club and they can they can make their rules so I can I can understand why they've done it but I do feel sorry for the for the top ranking players uh, that are not able to compete. The world's got to make a stance so I get it I, I do get it but I, I think it's a terrible shame for them. A spokesperson for the Kremlin has said the decision turns athletes into hostages to political prejudice and that the competition will suffer from their removal. Now, in response, Wimbledon has been stripped of its ranking points. So that means no matter how athletes do over the next two weeks, they will not be able to move up the rank after this competition. Canadians competing in the main singles draw. Denise Shapovalov, Felix Auger Aliasim, Bianca Andrescu. Canadians will be cheering them on, hoping that they can make it all the way to the finals. Ashley Burke, CBC News, London. At least three people have been killed after an Amtrak passenger train hit a dump truck and derailed in Missouri. Hit a truck. Someone was crossing the tracks. Officials say numerous people have been hurt, but it's still not clear how many. The Southwest chief was traveling from LA to Chicago, carrying about 243 passengers and 12 crew when the collision occurred. Passengers included high school students from Kansas heading to a future business leaders conference in Chicago. This Friday is Canada Day, and for the first time since the pandemic began, there will be in-person celebrations in Ottawa. But there are also plans for some major protests. That has triggered concerns about a repeat of this winter's so-called freedom convoy. But as Rafi Bujikanian reports, police say this time, they're ready. This is what Canada Day in Ottawa normally looks like. Now police say they want to make sure this year's edition is not something like this. Freedom! 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 We have the people, the skills and the equipment to ensure that these events are safe and peaceful. We expect there to be demonstrations. This is a right of all Canadians and it will be protected. We will not, however, accept unlawful behaviour. Among the precautions, a no-vehicle control zone, but that does not include the Byward Market, where business owners have yet to forget February's events. I'm furious that they've been allowed to come back. Back then, Miriam Farbiash reduced business hours and limited who could walk into her shop after this happened. A gentleman wandered back and forth in front of the store, pushed his way in front of, through the store without a mask. I told him to put on a mask. He said he was exempt. I said, put it on or leave. He came back the following day with a threatening letter from QAnon. At least one group of protesters, though, is saying it won't be party to any disruption. You know, what's going to happen on Canada Day is that I think that many Canadians are going to celebrate Canada Day. They're going to celebrate Canada Day here in Ottawa. Uh, I will probably join them as well as the members of my team. This Canadian veteran started a walk to Ottawa in February against vaccine mandates that were still in place at the time. It's not clear how long he intends to stay, though another group, the Veterans for Freedom, say they plan to hold events through to Labor Day. Police are cagey on details, but say they've got that handled too. As long as there are public safety concerns, we will have operations in effect to manage those, regardless of how long they last. With ongoing renovations on Parliament Hill, the Heritage Department has already moved this year's festivities nearly two kilometres away from here. But authorities aren't taking any chances. They've fenced off the Supreme Court building ahead of the protest. 
Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Ottawa. There has been a police raid and arrests in connection with an alleged scam by a national moving company. CBC's Marketplace had looked into the Toronto-based firm after customers complained that the bill for their discount move exploded once their belongings were loaded onto the truck. David Common has the details. Rarely do customer complaints lead to a large-scale police raid like this, laying fraud and multiple other charges against Jamal Ozturk and Doan Chelik, who together ran a supposedly low-cost national moving company that goes by multiple names, but police allege had one thing in common. Customers were offered a seemingly low-cost contract. But once the items were loaded onto a truck, the men would contact the customers, making a demand for more money, often in the thousands of dollars, and refuse delivery until payment was made. The police action comes on the heels of a hidden camera investigation by CBC Marketplace into the same movers, where similar behavior was documented. They charged this young woman a lot more than they said they were going to charge her. A lot more. Yet another customer, Darlene Sherrington, was told her move would cost a little more than a thousand. But after the movers pick up her stuff... On the highway, I get a call from the girl at the main office. She says, your bill now is $3,029. More than double what she's expecting. They shouldn't be doing this to old people or even young people. None of the charges against the two men have been proven in court, but Toronto police are now reuniting customers with belongings, including family heirlooms and the ashes of deceased loved ones. They're also seizing moving trucks and other assets. It's, it's tricky at the moment because we're still trying to figure out what's there and what needs to go to PEI and what needs to go to London and what needs to go other places in the Maritimes. Before his arrest, Doan Chalik told Marketplace his companies value customers and that he'd review what happened. The criminal charges show many others will be reviewing too. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. A kind of peace has settled over Stanley Park after several conflicts between coyotes and humans last year. The animals bit dozens of visitors, so a call was done. How they're working to keep the conflicts down in the crown jewel? Right after this. And at 6.41, a live look at the lighthouse in Euclid. Clouds moving in on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and they're heading our way. Johanna has your BC-wide forecast right after this. Year after year, you know, I was told, no, you can't be a musician, you can't be an orchestra, you can't be in band. Then I would go home, and I would play fake Tchaikovsky or anything I heard on the radio, and I'd be all smiles. There was no way that you could tell me I was not a musician. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Buffy St. Marie. Buffy St. Marie. For a lot of us Indigenous people, Buffy is the musician, the artist, the icon. And she's been standing up for us for decades, singing our names and our nations when people thought we were extinct. But outside of Indigenous country, it's different. I was made aware of the fact that I was an Indian and that that could be good or that might not be so good depending upon the way I handle it. People rarely call women geniuses, but Buffy is absolutely stone cold genius. The phone rang. He says, Buffy, Elvis just recorded your song. Hardly anybody knows I wrote it. Whether you know it or not, Buffy's been at the center of so many defining moments. Of course there's a genocide in America. And America's finding out about it, and Canada's finding out about it, but so far nobody's doing anything except the Indians themselves. She was doing this on a national stage like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Turns out that her music had been suppressed by the government and there was an FBI file on her. It's really a privilege to step on a stage where no matter who's in the audience, I'm gonna make them feel better and yet not skirt the issues. You can make this into the, the country that it's supposed to be. I'm Phelan Johnson. I'm Mohawk and Tuscarora. Buffy is a five-part series from CBC Podcasts where I take you on an intimate journey through the life of Buffy St. Marie. Hear Buffy on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to attract hummingbirds into your backyard, it should be quite simple. Most hummingbird feeders will be a bit like this red base, and that's a good thing because hummingbirds look for red things. 
put it up somewhere in front of your window, somewhere you can see it. You want to see hummingbirds close, right? They will come close. So it's really easy to make the sugar water that goes into a hummingbird feeder. Just under a cup of sugar. And then I'm going to mix it with about four cups of water. Give it a really good shake. And there you have it. The wonderful thing about these birds is that next year, that hummingbird may well be back to your window because they remember where the feeders are. A recent spate of hot weather has meant Vancouver's biggest park was very busy this weekend. And you've been, if you've been wondering if you'll run into a coyote at Stanley Park, chances appear to be low right now. The animals bit 45 people, including children from December 2020 to last summer. But Chad Pawson has more on new measures aiming, aimed to keep those encounters down. New warning signs, animal-proof garbage cans, a bylaw prohibiting feeding wildlife, plus something more to keep coyotes away from humans in Stanley Park. It's a covert team of eight people walking trails just like everyday users, but they're seeking out coyotes to observe how they behave and scaring them off if needed with noise. We've had two instances of aversion conditioning in the park uh, in over 70 patrols um, over the last six weeks or so. Um, and in both of those cases, shaking a, a can and taking steps towards a coyote has resulted in the coyote leaving immediately. So that's a really good sign that tells us that coyotes are wary of humans in the park right now. Officials responsible for the park are encouraged this year compared to last when aggressive coyote attacks and bites were happening. They say changes such as animal proof garbage cans, a wildlife feeding bylaw and the aversion conditioning program are helping as are the individual efforts of park users. I think people are starting to understand that we're all a collective group that needs to solve this problem. Officials say less garbage is being left in the park and the wildlife feeding bylaw is working. So far, two tickets worth $500 each have been issued. There's a confidence that park users are more aware. When we ask people, you know, please don't feed wildlife, it's, it tends to be responded to very positively. Um, when we let them know the steps, if a coyote gets too close to you, they seem to understand it. Any encounters with coyotes can be reported to the Stanley Park Ecology Society or the province's Conservation Officer Hotline. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver. She's back. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now with the forecast. Joe, down at English Bay yesterday. Not a lot of mm. people swimming because of the E. coli warning, but holy right. moly, it's busy. People loving the heat. Yes, really the first true taste of summer uh, that we've had. I know we've had a couple of nice days, but now we know for a fact it has not been summer until this moment. Uh, and we do see the heat wave coming to an end rapidly just for a few days uh, before we see some nice heat build in for the end of the week. Nothing too extreme, uh, but let me take you through the big picture, starting with a quick snapshot of the temperatures we hit today. 33 out towards Abbotsford, 34 at Pitt Meadows, YVR 25, but of course inland uh, hitting the high 20s in downtown Vancouver, feeling that heat across the island as well. And as I mentioned earlier, Lytton was hot spot across the country, but even hitting uh, the mid 30s in through the Okanagan and up towards Kamloops as well. Uh, again, not breaking daily temperature records, uh, but, oh, I skipped ahead to the forecast. Uh, I should have teased that up. Uh, we are not seeing the kind of heat we saw a year ago. Things are changing before I get to our seven day forecast. Look as that marine air moves in overnight tonight. This is taking you through the next uh, 48 hours, and you can see all of that activity in the BC interior. Most of that is thunderstorms, widespread thunderstorm risk tomorrow across the province. And a lot of these thunderstorms in our models, it's, it's going to be hard to say exactly who gets those thunderstorms, 
But if we do see them, uh, they might end up moving over the same area for hours on end. So flash flooding is a risk tomorrow in the interior. And we do have those flood warnings in place for the Quinell River. Uh, rivers are very swollen uh, right across the province because of the rapid snow melt that we're still seeing it due to these warm temperatures. So this uh, system tomorrow, a little bit uh, on guard as far as localized flash flooding. And you can see that showing up in the forecast for almost everyone, risk of a thunderstorm. And here in the lower mainland, there is a risk of a thunderstorm too. Again, the collision of these two air masses uh, may bring a stray thunderstorm. I think our best chance into Metro Vancouver is late afternoon. Not everyone will see it, but be prepared for a, a clap of thunder and uh, some localized downpours. That'll continue in through Wednesday morning. Notice our temperatures coming down to seasonal over the next couple of days. And then we've got a little bit of a warm up Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Dan. Uh, not quite as hot as where we were at, but mm -hmm. we're in like summer again for a long weekend. Because hmm. it's still summer. Right, Joe? It's still summer. Yep. Check, check my watch. Okay. Still summer. Yep. That's why we hire you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, as Pride celebrations wind up and down in parts of Canada, advocates continue to press the case of LGBTQ refugees. Many are still facing major hurdles because of the pandemic. Resettlement dropped to an all-time low. The CBC's Philippe de Montigny has the details. Maymouna Diomande left the Ivory Coast to seek asylum in Toronto back in January 2020. She didn't speak English, wasn't ready for Canadian winters, then came the pandemic and lockdowns. But these challenges paled in comparison to what the bisexual woman had endured in her home country. She was raped, her girlfriend stabbed to death. <sighs> I had no tears left to cry, she said, and she's not the only one in limbo. Joao, a gay Brazilian, also fled homophobic slurs and threats. CBC News agreed to grant him confidentiality in order to protect his family back home. All the time in Brazil, you think like someone is judging me, someone is looking at me, someone and sometimes someone can hurt me. He was granted refugee status in July last year. A double-edged sword, he says. My mom was diagnosed with lung cancer, and now I can't see her, because I can't go back to my country. He could visit her in a neighboring country, but has been waiting to get his travel documents sorted by Immigration Canada for nearly 10 months. You kind of feel like, okay, my mom had to die for me to have my documents and see her. Rainbow Railroad, which supports LGBTQ refugees, received 8,500 requests last year, most from Afghanistan, fleeing the Taliban regime. The Toronto organization helped around 200 relocate to other countries. Only four moved to Canada. Now that travel restrictions are being lifted uh, all around the world, we expect to see refugee resettlement uh, not just resume, but there needs to be a dramatic effort to catch up. He's asking Ottawa to make Rainbow Railroad a referring partner to help find and vet LGBTQ refugees, something Canada depends on the United Nations to do. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. Recognizing a neighbor who lived nearly 100 years in her Winnipeg home, why she meant so much and how they're remembering her after this. Yeah, this is a big season for our female crew, the Verso crew. It was the first time we were able to row the long course, which is traditionally been rowed by men only. Um, we were super excited that the Royal St. John's Regatta Committee was able to um, allow females to row the long course for the first time ever. It was absolutely amazing. As we were passing through the ladies' kegs, our coxswain um, called for let's make history, and then we pushed right through those kegs and right, went right to the bottom of the pond. Yeah, this has been about 20 years in the making. A number of female crews and a number of female advocates before this had wanted to row the long course. Um, I think it was something that the Royal St. John's Regatta Committee had wanted for a long time too. Um, it's just very exciting that we were able to make it happen this year. After two years of long COVID and having this now is something that females can really, um, I guess, enjoy for the first time ever. The idea has been around for quite a while. We've been working towards it. Um, and of course, 
you know, we've gotten some input from the, the crews as well, and we heard what they wanted. So uh, this year happened to be a, a great timing to implement the new race courses. Um, it's just really exciting. Like, I re remember hearing about the first women's crew to ever row, and I just thought that was so cool. So I'm so happy to be part of the first crew to do the full course. Yeah. <laughs> was it harder than you thought? No, it was easier than I thought. Actually, I thought it was going to be really hard, but it was not bad. Was, I actually liked it more than the shorter course. Yeah. That is sad. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we were excited to race this morning, and then when it actually happened and coming to the finish line and seeing everybody at the top of the pond cheering and then coming in and seeing the committee uh, clapping their hands and then also having all the crews on dockside, it was pretty emotional. I think there was a few tears for us all. It was a great morning and a great feel. Despite the windy conditions, we got to feel what it was really like to go right down to the bottom of the pond. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Celebrate the healing power of the arts at the annual Indian Summer Festival, July 7th to 17th. Enjoy diversity in film, music, and dance, and thought-provoking discussions. Get tickets and learn more at indiansummerfestival.ca. And experience the wonders of choral singing from the comfort of home with a free digital concert with Corleone. Learn more and register today at corleone.org. A majestic wooden bird now stands as a monument to a local matriarch on a quiet Winnipeg street. As Holly Karuk reports, it's a lasting tribute to a 100-year-old woman from the neighborhood where she lived her entire life. A carved wooden eagle sits perched atop this maple stump, carved from a piece of oak cut down across the street. It's been transformed into a majestic tribute to a dear friend. We couldn't have picked a nicer bird for Georgie. Up until a couple of years ago, this was the home of Georgie Hodges. Georgie was a fixture in the neighborhood. She could often be seen pulling weeds and tending to these flower boxes well into her 90s. She's now 100 years old and lives in a personal care home. Georgie was an extremely independent woman. Jill Patrick met Georgie more than 40 years ago. Georgie would be very humbled by this and also very delighted. So Martha Reimer lives two doors down. She hired this local wood sculptor to help her honor her former neighbor. An eagle represents strength and resilience, and uh, and I think that was that was Georgie. Like that, just her character was one of, of strength and resilience. Georgie moved into the house in 1924 when she was two years old and lived there her entire life before moving to the care home. Reimer and her husband met Georgie eight years ago when they moved to the area. They became friends and enjoyed hearing the elderly woman's stories about the neighborhood in simpler times. Georgie would often tell stories of how she and her sister would play in the canal and how their mother sold raspberries from their garden during the Great Depression. The senior also recounted the days of Winnipeg's electric streetcars. Georgie and her sister June stayed in the home after their parents passed away. They wouldn't live anywhere else. Saint Patel uh, was their soul. The Rhymers have since bought Georgie's house and worked to preserve its history before renting it out. Georgie's name is still on the mailbox. Rhymer said she wanted to give Georgie a permanent place in the neighborhood. She didn't have children and, you know, I didn't want her life just to disappear. Wood sculptor Lucas Cost was hired. 
to carve out her piece of history. All I can ask for as an artist is to have the opportunity to make something that's really meaningful to, to someone else. Now living with dementia, Georgie may never get the chance to see the eagle in person. But Patrick says when the time comes, they'll bring her by. When Georgie leaves us, we will drive Georgie past this house one more time. Holly Carrick, CBC News, Winnipeg. Good neighbours. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. We are back to regular one-hour programming now that the Stanley Cup playoff final is over. You can watch this program on CBC GM, our free app, and on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is at 11 o'clock with Leanne Young right after the National. Good night.